My name is Mark tessier levine I have the privilege of serving as the president of the Rockefeller University. And we're gathered here uh, this evening to celebrate the 11th annual presentation of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. Uh, your presence is a splendid show of support for the wonderful prize established by Paul Greengard uh, and his wife, Ursula von Reidingsvard, and other generous friends of the university. Uh, I should say that Ursula wanted to be with us this evening, uh, but unfortunately she had to travel to uh, the UK uh, today for a major exhibition of her work, and so she sends her best wishes and congratulations to our recipient, Dr. Lucy Shapiro. Uh, now, if this is your first uh, Green Guard Prize ceremony, I'd like to give you some background on this important award. Uh, as many of you know, in 2000, Paul Green Guard received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his crucial discoveries about the brain's biochemistry. Paul and Ursula decided to donate their monetary share of his Nobel Prize to create the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize for Outstanding Women Scientists. A number of the university's friends and benefactors were so moved by Paul and Ursula's gesture that they also contributed uh, to the endowment of this prize. Now, Paul believed, and continues to believe, uh, that women were not being recognized at a level commensurate with their scientific contributions. He was determined to use his new prominence as a Nobel laureate to address this issue th through the creation of an award, an international award, uh, for women scientists. Paul named the prize uh, in memory of his mother, Pearl Meister Greengard, who died tragically giving birth to him. Now, during its first decade, the Perlmeister Greengard Prize honored women uh, who have made major contributions in many different fields, including cancer research, immunology, genetics, biophysics, and neuroscience. Their discoveries, in fact, are among the most remarkable of the last 60 years by men or women. Last year, the university asked uh, the gifted science writer, uh, Evelyn Strauss, to profile the careers of these illustrious women their profiles were compiled to create a wonderful book to commemorate the first uh, decade of this important prize. Uh, copies of the book are available in the lobby, and you're welcome to take one on your way out tonight. Now tonight, uh, we are here to honor Dr. Lucy Shapiro, the recipient of the 2014 Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. Dr. Shapiro was chosen by the members of the selection committee, a group of distinguished scientists, including five Nobel laureates. I'm honored to serve on this committee and I invite you to refer to your program for a complete list of the members. Uh, in recent years, Rockefeller has made it uh, an institutional priority to close the gender gap in the sciences. And I'd like on this occasion to recognize the Female Association of Clinicians, Educators, and Scientists, known as FACES, and also WISER, Women in Science at Rockefeller. These two initiatives have embraced this important prize, and they hosted Dr. Shapiro for a special discussion this morning with some of our young women scientists. And now I'd like to introduce our prize presenter, Dame Shirley, uh, Stephanie Shirley. <clears throat> Dame Stephanie Shirley, uh, or Steve as she's often called, is well known as a pioneer in business technology and an ardent philanthropist. Born in Germany, uh, she immigrated to England as an unaccompanied child refugee during World War II. And from a very early age, she developed a love of mathematics, a subject that girls were not encouraged to pursue at the time. However, she was undeterred. As a young adult, she studied mathematics at university while working full time. It was the 1950s and the dawn of computers, and Dame Stephanie saw that this new field offered an opportunity for her to combine her love of math with the practical application of programming. Facing early gender discrimination in her career, uh, she decided to start her own computer software company in 1962. Uh, she, in fact, began to sign her name as Steve in correspondence in an effort to receive consideration from prospective clients. <laughs> Initially, uh, she employed women, predominantly as computer programmers, allowing them to work from home while caring for children and other dependents. In doing so, she opened doors for women to enter this field of technology and also pioneered a new business practice that would become a model for freelance employment. Dame Stephanie wanted to form a company by women for women, and she was very successful. By offering women opportunities, encouragement, and training, her business grew from a small cadre of employees to a staff of thousands. She also believed in broad ownership, and when she took the company public in 2000, more than half of its shares were owned by her employees 70 of whom became millionaires as a result. Now, during her retirement in 1993, Dame, Dame Stephanie was devoted, has devoted herself to philanthropy. Much of her support goes to the study of autism, a disorder her own son suffered from. 
she's given away more than 67 million pounds or 100 million dollars to the cause. Through her personal foundation, she also supports the study of internet technology and its role in society. In 2012, she published a memoir, Let It Go, which has been widely praised for its personal touch, as well as its detailed account of building a business in a new, new and challenging arena. I'm honored to welcome Dame Stephanie Shirley to the stage. Please join me in welcoming her. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for welcoming me to this great university, uh, the first institution in the US devoted solely to biomedical research, and for that more than effusive introduction. I also want to thank the prize-giving uh, committee for inviting me to participate in the presentation of this significant award. I do applaud Dr. Greengard's initiative and I give heartfelt congratulations to this year's award winner, Dr. Lucy Shapiro. This is by way of being a celebration. But let me start on a somber note. Explain why I am wearing this poppy. It is to commemorate the dead from the different wars. The practice of wearing poppies started in this country, in New York, in 1918. World War I, the Great War, the war that was supposed to stop all future wars, in that war, General Pershing led 1.4 million Americans, of whom 117,000 died. Armistice was declared at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The losses for World War II the deadliest war ever, included 407,000 Americans. This Veterans Day is a day for remembrance. I've been asked to share my research history with you and do so with pride and English-style humility. <laughs> I'm a technology entrepreneur and advocate for autism, determined to transition science into service delivery. The Science Council listed me recently as one of the top practicing scientists in the UK. As you've heard, I was born in Germany into a respectable family, and if all had gone according to plan, I would have remained in that bourgeois, comfortable world indefinitely. It's unlikely that I would have ever had the experienced what Picasso called the ultimate seduction, work. We never know what life holds for us. All that I am stems from when I was five years old and uh, was put onto a kinder train in Vienna, one of the dozen or so trains organized to save 10,000 mainly Jewish children from Nazi Europe. I'm only alive because so long ago I was saved by generous strangers. Each train had about a thousand children, aged five to 16, a few 17 year olds also snuck in, with just two adults. There were also a few girls, aged 16 plus, so not eligible to come out, but they were caring for babies. Of course, I didn't know at the time, but they, those volunteers traveled under a concession dependent on their return to what they must have known was almost certain death. I like always to honor the sheer heroism of those young people. The trauma of that experience triggered in me two things. I learned to... Uh, accept change, that tomorrow is going to be different to today and certainly nothing like yesterday. And that led to my eventually welcoming change, which was pretty useful for me in my high-tech area. 
And secondly, I decided at a very young age to make mine a life that was worth saving. Then I just got on with it. That was 75 years ago. You see before you a museum piece. I'm in the National Museum of Computing in England as, as a late pioneer of the discipline and some of my early work papers are in the American Computer Museum. So where did my success come from? To circumvent the gender issues of the time, this was in the 1950s, I set up my own high-tech software company, one of the UK's first such startups. It was a company of women. It was a company for women. An early social business. People laughed at the very idea. Software at that time was given away with the hardware. Nobody would buy software, certainly not from a woman. Although women were then coming out of the universities with de decent degrees, there was a glass ceiling to our progress. But I wanted opportunities for women. I recruited professionally qualified women who had left the computer industry on marriage or when their first child was expected and structured them into a home-working organization. We pioneered the concept of women going back into the workforce after a career break. We pioneered a whole lot of new work methods. We pioneered all sorts of flexible working, job shares, then profit shares, and later, as you've heard, co-ownership. I got so the shares into the hands of the staff at no cost to anyone but me. I was a pathfinder in the professionalism of women, especially in high tech. And for years, I was the first woman this, the only woman that. My generation of women fought the battles for the right to work and for equal pay. When handsome young men used to offer to carry my equipment for me, um, I used to reply somewhat tetchily, I believe in equal pay and will carry my own equipment. <laughs> Nowadays it's, how kind, thank you so much. No one expected much from women in work because all the uh, expectations were about home and family responsibilities. I couldn't accept that and so challenge the conventions of the day. Even as you've heard to the extent of changing my name from Stephanie to Steve in my business development letters so that I got through that door before anyone realized that he was a she. <laughs> It couldn't have started smaller. On the dining room table, with what would now be $100, but financed by my own labor and by borrowing against the marital home. My interests were scientific. The market was commercial. Things such as payroll, which I found excruciatingly <gasps> boring. So I went for operational research, which uh, was both intellectually satisfying and commercially valued. Stock control, scheduling freight trains, timetabling coaches. Gradually, the work came in. We disguised the domestic and part-time nature of the workforce by offering fixed prices. Who would have guessed that the software for the black box flight recorder for the supersonic Concorde was done by a bunch of women working in their own homes? <laughs> An early project for Diebold was to develop software standards, management control protocols. Software was, and still is, a maddeningly hard to pin down activity. So that was enormously valuable to be paid to do that. And we used the standards ourselves and were even paid to update them over the years. And eventually they were adopted by NATO. Our programmers worked with pencil and paper to develop flowcharts, 
defining the task to be done. They then wrote code, either in machine code or sometimes even in binary, which was sent by mail to a data center for punching onto punch cards or paper tape. And then they were repunched in order to verify that all this prior to submission to the mainframe computer. That was programming in the early 60s. When I started my company of women, um, the men sort of said, how interesting. But of course it only works because it's small. And as the company grew, the same men commented, yes, it's sizable now, uh, but of no strategic interest. And later still, when it was a gazillion dollar business and 70 of my colleagues were also multi-millionaires, they commented, well done, Steve. <laughs> what an attitude to change. You can always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top from being patted patronizingly. <laughs> Sometimes we have larger feet to stand away from the kitchen sink because women still have a long way to go. In 1975, 13 years from the company's startup, Britain's equal opportunities legislation came in, making it illegal to have our pro-female policies. As an example of unintended consequences, my woman's company had to let the men in. <laughs> when the company was acquired after 45 years, it was quoted on the London Stock Exchange and employed over 8,000 people, men and women, which is as it should be. Let me share with you two secrets of commercial success. Employ on only people who are better than you are. And be careful to choose a supportive partner. The other day when I said, my husband's an angel, a woman complained, you're lucky, she said, mine's still alive. <laughs> if, if success were easy, we'd all be millionaires. In my case, it came in the midst of family pressures. Our son, Giles, was an only child, a beautiful, contented baby. And then, at two and a half, like a changeling in a fairy story, he lost the little speech that he had and turned into a wild, unmanageable toddler. Not the terrible twos. He was autistic. And he never spoke again. My mission is pioneering, uh, never more of the same, no matter how wonderful or how worthy, and always strategic. And what do I mean by that? Um, things that, if successful, will make a real difference, that produce tangible results in the sea of need. And in the two things that I, the only two things really, that I know and care about, and that is information technology, my professional discipline, and autism, my late son's disorder. He died at the age of 35. Classically, Giles had been the first resident in the first home of the first charity that I set up. It was founded to pioneer services to autism. It took 17 years to become financially and managerially independent of me, because it's not enough to do good. It has to be sustainable. Later, I founded a very special residential school uh, for pupils with autism. This also now has a an adult learning center, that only took me five years. 
then an autism lobbying charity. Two years to get that going. My most recent charity, Autistica, funds medical research to understand what autism is as distinct from what it looks like. I mean, I can recognize an autistic child the other side of the playground, but we really don't understand yet what it is. And my training for that really came from this country, uh, because I served two years uh, as a trustee of the American charity that morphed into Autism Speaks. My current emphasis is on setting up a national autism project, a sort of modern think tank. And that's scheduled to keep me busy for the next three years. Not only do I pay tribute to Dr. Paul Greengard for sponsoring this prize, but I also applaud his discoveries on the genetics of autism. To date, um, I've donated a lot of money, investment really, in not-for-profit projects, mainly in autism. Giving is all that I do now. I need never worry about getting lost because several charities would quickly come and find me. <laughs> Despite the vastly different fields, the basic journey of research is generic. Discover, gather, analyze, create, share. Though I recognize that replication is the cornerstone of good science, I love to learn. I love to do new things and make new things happen. And, but research calls on different skills, so there's potential for many of us to have the beautiful but frightening experience of being the first to know something. Women, women are not just consumers, but also creators of new technologies and applications. And it's important to recognize outstanding women in science. So many have already been written out of the history of science. The very first programmer was the scarcely known Ada Lovelace, the daughter of the mad, bad, and dangerous to know romantic poet Lord Byron. And she first put forward the idea that humanities and technologies should coexist. There's a picture in my study showing the hippocampus part of the, uh, the autistic brain. It is as beautiful as any work of art. Dr. Lucy Shapiro, who developed the very beginning of systems biology, comments as an artist about the beauty of the entire living world and sees the sciences as part of the arts. She credits much of her success to her roles as mother and grandmother. Her children anchored her. And that resonates uh, with my experiences with my autistic child. She and I also share a powerful sense of social responsibility. But we differ markedly in that she is able to work and work amicably with her husband. <laughs> Whereas in no way could I work with my husband. He starts with detail and works from the bottom up. I start with general concepts and work top down. So we kill each other before we met somewhere in the middle. But now to the purpose of this wonderful evening. We're here to honor Dr. Lucy Shapiro, professor of Stanford University's School of Medicine for her work in developmental biology. She is a role model for women scientists worldwide. May her life be as full and fulfilling as mine has been. Thank you very much.
thank you so much, Dame Stephanie, for those inspiring words. <clears throat> I'd now like to introduce Dr. Lucy Shapiro, our honoree this evening. Lucy is a native New Yorker who received her undergraduate degree from Brooklyn College, where she majored in fine arts and biology. Her initial intention was to make a career in medical illustration, but her interest became more technical, and she entered graduate school at Albert Einstein Medical College. There, she received a PhD in molecular biology and became a faculty member for 19 years before taking an appointment at Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons as professor and chairman of the Department of Microbiology. In 1989, she joined Stanford University's new Department of Developmental Biology as the Virginia and D.K. Ludwig Professor and Director of the Beckman Center for Molecular and Genetic Medicine. As a scientist, uh, Dr. Shapiro defies categorization. Early in her career, she adopted an unconventional approach to the study of development by focusing on a single-celled cell, organism, a bacterium, rather than the embryonic cells of a complex animal. Her work revealed how a dividing cell can precisely coordinate its activities in space and time to generate two daughter cells that are different from each other in form and function. The process that she studied in single-celled organisms actually parallel the behavior of dividing cells in multicellular life forms, including human beings. Dr. Shapiro's work has also led to uh, the development of a novel drug to treat fungal infections, a rare achievement that speaks to the originality of her research and the fundamental significance of her discoveries. A member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine, uh, Lucy has received numerous other high honors, including the Louisa Gross Horvitz Prize, the Canada Gairdner International Award, and the National Medal of Science. We're also delighted that members of Lucy's family are here this evening, including her sister, Judy, her daughter, Heather, and her son and daughter-in-law, Peter and Nancy. Welcome. Now, in a few minutes, I'll talk with uh, Lucy about her career in science, but first, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Shapiro to the stage. Dame Stephanie, will you join us as well for the presentation uh, of the award? <clears throat> and now I'll uh, read uh, excerpts from the citation. Lucy Shapiro, you are being honored for discoveries that have revolution revolutionized our understanding of the interdependent re relationship between the basic genetic material, DNA, and the basic unit of life, the cell. By revealing unexpected unexpe parallels between single-celled and multicellular life, you've provided essential insights into how all cells organize themselves in space and time. You've been a pioneer in research at the interface of physics and biology, and you've applied fundamental knowledge to meet the challenges of drug discovery. Your transformative achievements in basic science and the improvement of human health have captured the imaginations of generations of biomedical investigators worldwide. And now, Dame Stephanie. That's my pitch. It's your pitch. <laughs> It is my honor this evening to present to Dr. Lucy Shapiro the Paul Meister Greengard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical sciences. On behalf of the distinguished jury of the Paul Meister Greengard Prize and of all of us here today, we congratulate you on the award. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dame Stephanie. And now, Lucy, please have a seat with me. Um, actually, I, I think you have a... I have a few things, things to say. That's right. <laughs> Why don't you start first? And then we'll... I'll start first. <laughs> this is an enormous honor. Uh, it's such a deeply thoughtful thing that Paul and Ursula did in instituting this award and how it serves as a significant event for all the young women, graduate students and postdocs and new assistant professors 
to see the celebration of the incredible science that has been done by many, many women before me. For me, it's an honor to be considered as part of the cadre of extraordinary women who have received this award. It means a tremendous amount. And yes, I've won several awards. This is special. This is really special. And my hour or hour and a half this morning with the Rockefeller students and postdocs and MD-PhD students was really amazing. Uh, I was able to talk with a group of very smart, very talented women, figuring out how is my life going to be? How can I do this? What are the problems I'm going to face? How did you do it? What were your problems? And of course, there were lots. Uh, and having this opportunity really reflects the progress of each of our lives. And I must give you a little bit of background because my life in science began, oddly enough, here at Rockefeller University. And it began with a physical chemist here named Ted Shedlovsky, who only a few will remember. And I was in my senior year in college, and I was part of an art exhibit. And Ted attended and bought one of my paintings. And I got to know him. And it turned out that Ted had this thing about finding young people in the arts. Another one was Jerry Edelman. <laughs> And there are a group of us called Shedlovsky's Kids. And he became a mentor. And the first thing, I guess he really wanted me to go into science because he wasn't so sure about my painting. But uh, the first thing he did uh, was say, what you must do now is take a course in organic chemistry. And I said, yes, Ted. <laughs> and I did. And it was a transformative moment. Uh, clearly, it was the way my mind worked. I had just finished my senior thesis in college on why Dante wrote in the vernacular and not Latin. And then I met organic chemistry, where things I thought were real and beautiful. And they did all kinds of stuff. And that changed my life. He sent me off to Jerry Hurwitz who is a, what I call a jungle biochemist. And I, I won't explain too much about that, but that was right here in New York City. And four years later, I had my PhD in molecular biology. And throughout that whole time, Ted Shedlovsky remained my mentor. Jerry Hurwitz was an enormously influential mentor because he made me become uh, an analytical thinker and to challenge everything I was doing and thinking about, and was steadfast in never complimenting me, ever, uh, but making sure that what I did was hard and true and accurate. And I must say, Jerry is 87 now, and he just got a renewal of his NIH grant. And we still talk about every few months, and we talk about experiments. And it's after all these years. So one day, he, I was speaking with him at 4 in the afternoon, and I was home. And he heard my dog bark. And he called me Kitty. I know, but that's what he called me. He said, Kitty, where are you? I said, um, I'm home. He said, it's only 4 o'clock in California. You should be in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other person who was a very... Uh, important mentor to me was a woman, and her name was Barbara McClintock. And for all the time I was a graduate student, I worked at Cold Spring Harbor for three months out of the year, and I got to know her quite well. And when I finished my graduate work, and which was all in biochemistry on polymerases, and was only a postdoc for six months when I was offered an assistant professorship in the same department that I had gotten my PhD in, I took three months to think about what I wanted to work on. And few people have that opportunity these days, and it was a very wonderful thing to happen. And it was then that I decided what I wanted to know about was how a single cell 
integrated all of its functions into a single system that used not only time, but space. And I wanted to go beyond cracking open cells and looking at the biochemistry of individual enzyme reactions. I wanted to go beyond the exquisite genetics that everybody was doing at that time in E. coli, in a long time ago, uh, and which is critical for everything we do. I wanted to be able to go into the living cell, and I wanted to understand that, you know, a living cell is not going to exhibit michaelis metten kinetics. A living cell, you know, have a femtoliter of, of stuff and what's happening in there. It was going to be hard. And I wanted to figure out then, and I set out everything I was going to do for years to come to try to understand how a cell is organized, is integrated into a system, going all the way from the genome to where it puts things in the cell, ultimately giving you an asymmetric division, giving you cells of two different types that read the genome differently. The fundamental basis of the generation of diversity in all living things. And I wanted my hydrogen atom. I didn't want a complicated cell. And I found colobacter. Colo means stalk, colobacter. This is a stalk bacteria which had stuff at either end, and I could use this as my hydrogen atom. Then, the other critical thing that happened was that I was at Albert Einstein College of Medicine where there was a group of distinguished senior women, including Aura Rosen, Susan Horowitz, Salome Welsh, and many others, who showed me the way. They were working. They were doing amazing things. Many had children. And that had an enormous impact on what I thought I could do. And then what happened was that it was obvious to me that collaborators were essential. And probably my most important collaborator, as Dame Stephanie referred to before, was my husband. Uh, Harley McAdams uh, was a physicist at Bell Laboratories, and I was at Columbia when I got an offer to move to Stanford to establish a new department of developmental biology, even though I was working on a bacterial cell. And it was uh, an exciting offer. But Harley did not have a job on the West Coast. He was a department head at Bell Labs and doing amazing stuff. And one day he came home and he said, you know, Lucy, we're moving to the West Coast. He said, how often does one get the incredible opportunity to establish a brand new department in a remarkable school? And equally important, how often does a woman get that offer? He said, we're going. And I said, but you don't have a job. <laughs> and he said, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. And so we moved across country. He made me camp all the way in a sleeping bag. And I'm a New Yorker, and I had never even seen a sleeping bag. <laughs> but we did do that. We made it to California. And Harley worked for Lockheed and hated it. Uh, Bell Labs is like a university. Lockheed wasn't. And then he became quite interested in what we were doing with the complicated circuitry in Colobacter. And before we knew it, he became a professor at Stanford and moved into our department. And I thought, well, this is the end of a wonderful marriage. <laughs> uh, how can we possibly survive in the same place? Uh, and in fact, it worked. Um, we can fight ferociously about taking out the garbage, but we don't fight about the logic of our experiments and the conclusions that we draw from them. And that brings me to my next point, and that is what Harley brought was a lab full of students in physics and electrical engineering. And what we decided to do was integrate our laboratories. So a physicist sat next to a geneticist, and an engineer sat next to a biochemist. And the engineer said, well, if we build it, and it falls down, forget it, let's design something else. And we would say, no, 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 no. This is, this is a, the living world. Uh, you have to consider stochastic behavior. And that collaboration has been incredibly fruitful and very exciting. And I thought we were doing something quite unique in combining our labs 
And in fact, this was happening all over Stanford. So that the uh, interdisciplinary work is happening, of course, not only at Stanford, but everywhere. And biology has changed. And it's changed everything we do. Uh, I want to thank Harley for doing amazing stuff. Uh, he couldn't be with us here tonight, but I'm sure our children will report back. Um, finally, I think that this award is unique in that it really brings to the fore that we all think and have a passion for science that I believe is gender neutral. You're a scientist, full stop. And what I love more than anything in the world is going into the lab in the morning and being with my students and postdocs, both men and women, and watch that spark of fire when something wonderful happens. So thank you. So we're going to move to the So now we're going to have a conversation, and uh, I, will, <laughs> I will kick it off with a few questions, and then we'll open it to the, the audience um, to ask questions as well. And I guess, Lucy, you already touched on the problems that you were interested in when you, um, you described marvelously how you, you came to focus after your PhD and you started thinking about your career, what problems you wanted to, to tackle, and uh, the... Uh, unconventional idea of studying a bacterium yeah. um, to uh, illuminate the process of development that might be relevant to, to um, uh, higher organisms. But uh, you told us the questions you're interested in. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you discovered? Okay. Well, the first thing that became very apparent is that everybody had thought that the bacterial cell was like a swimming pool because it was so little anything could be anywhere by diffusion, right? And so therefore, there were no obvious structures. Things were just running around loosely. And the chromosome, a single circular piece of DNA, was a ball of spaghetti. And in fact, none of that is true. The bacterial cell is highly organized. The first thing we showed that was that signaling complexes have specific addresses in the cell. We then went ahead and looked at the chromosome <coughs> and found that that also is highly organized. And every locus on that chromosome has an address in the cell. And the cell uses that to control turning on and off regulatory genes as the chromosome is duplicated. So that there is this connection between where things are and how it, the cell uses that in the complex regulatory circuitry that was pioneered by Jacob and Minot a very long time ago. So what we are doing now is superimposing the third dimension on the regulatory pathways that were predicted and shown for a few genes in E. coli by Jacob and Minot. So spatial information yes. is used to regulate the genetic code. Yeah, and the exciting stuff now, I guess I shouldn't go on and do this, no. but <laughs> the no, exciting stuff now is that we have worked out how to use optogenetics to shine blue light and actually move these signaling proteins to the wrong place in the cell and then watch in real time where the rest of the signaling pathway proteins move because they're all tagged with fluorescent dyes. And working with W.E. Murner, we can track by super resolution microscopy individual molecules and where they're going and how they're behaving in this tiny bacterial cell. And what we have found was that my initial question of an asymmetric division giving you two different cells that read the genome differently, we can now actually see and perturb the deposition of these different signaling molecules to the two poles of the cell so that when cell division happens, 
you have different regulatory pathways. So you, you make this all sound so easy, but it might be worth <laughs> pointing out that uh, until you did this, I mean, moving um, these tools to, to be able to localize a molecule to a specific spot in real time have only just arisen recently, and you had to adapt them to this bacterial yeah, system. Yeah, that was last week. That was last week, <laughs> right? So people don't think this is uh, work done 30 years ago. No, no, this uh, is, this is and then the, last week. And then the super resolution microscopy is also a recent yeah. advance, so that you can, yeah. before the, the kinds of resolution like that just weren't Yeah, possible. well, there, there were a couple of Nobel Prizes this year for that night. I've been a collaborator with W.E. Murner for 10 years, and so we've been using. You know, I wanted to see inside this tiny one micron cell. You have to realize how little this is. I mean, it's a tenth the size of a nucleus of a HeLa cell. And yet, we can track the places where individual, fac you know, like a factory that does a job is here and then here, and then it has to move somewhere else, all to give you asymmetry. Maybe we could talk about your other passion, which came out in, in some of the remarks also, which is art. Um, and uh, art and music, I believe, uh, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, do you feel that your artistic training has influenced your scientific research? Only in one way, really, and that is um, my ability to see things in three-dimensional space and to translate what I see uh, into my drawing. I love to do portraits of people, and I do a lot of watercolor portraits. But when I face a blank canvas, it's the same feeling that I get when I face a blank piece of paper and try to figure out how I'm going to solve some sort of puzzle. Making a painting informs me of the world I'm seeing, and I learn from that. Designing an experiment with a good question, which is critical. Start with a question, and how can I answer that question? What's the best way of getting to that answer? So, so the two are really integrated. I wish I had more time to paint. I don't have very much more time to do that, but I miss it. I know that you've been um, uh, very concerned about education as well, and I know that we have some high school students here today, some of whom might be taking advanced placement biology. Uh, what advice do you have um, for young people um, who are interested in pursuing science? Well, it's got two parts. One, study the hard sciences. Study physics, study math, study chemistry. The study of biology and the biomedical sciences is really founded in chemistry and physics. And this is what you've got to know. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful to know. The other part of it is to have a passion for discovery. And I can always tell which of my students are going to really do well. And that's because they've got an unquenchable passion for what they're doing. And they argue with me, and, and they do what I call nighttime science. So they do the experiments that I tell them will never work. And of course they do them, but they just generally do them at night. And, <laughs> And, and you're not there to stop. Them. Of course, of course. And you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it does work. And the other thing that is really important is being a woman in science and raising a family. It's important to remember your passion. And for me, science has been the core of my life. And my children have brought the beauty and stability that Dame Stephanie referred to. And I don't think that the kinds of work that we do as scientists is incompatible with anything. We're all different. We all choose to work and live differently. But if the passion for science remains at the core of your existence, what better life can you possibly have? Now, your work also has, clearly what, what drove you was a desire to understand the inner workings of the cell and, mm -hmm. and these fundamental problems. 
but along the way you realized that your work could also have practical applications. Yes. Maybe you can tell us about that. Infectious diseases are very much in the news today with Ebola yeah. uh, and other things. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came to uh, focus on these kinds of applications, and secondly, tell us about what you've discovered. Well, I think that somewhere along the line, and it must have been in the early 90s, it became apparent to me that we were sitting at the center of a perfect storm, in that there was really a increasing dissemination of infectious disease agents for all the logical reasons, population explosion, we live in a village, uh, someone is sick in Nairobi, they're sick in Chicago in a day, uh, and now climate change. All of this is changing the ecology of infectious agents. And old pathogens are now in new places, and we have brand new pathogens that none of us have any immunity to that are appearing everywhere. That is happening at the same time that we are losing our antibiotics and antivirals. At the same time, our pharmaceutical agencies are much more interested in dealing with funding diseases that will go on and on and on needing their drugs. Uh, antibiotics are not terribly appealing. And so a lot of that has fallen to the small biotechs. So it seemed to me that it was my responsibility to try to do something about number one, getting this message out, and number two, trying to change things. And so I sort of set up a three-pronged attack. Uh, part of it helped by the fact that I was on the board of directors of Glaxo uh, for 10 years and I understood how the agencies worked. I decided the first thing I could do, better than they were doing, was design new antibiotics, new antifungals. And instead of going to uh, existing libraries, I called up my good friend and chemist, Steve Benkovic, who is just an absolutely visionary chemist. And we decided to make our own molecules. And they were based on boron instead of carbon at the active site. And uh, this has been very successful. And we chose targets that were obvious from the work we did in Colobacter and then translated them to fungal cells as well. And I had an, an interesting experience about a year ago. Uh, well, one of our compounds is used for trypanosomiasis and African sleeping sickness. And it's working very well. And it was paid for by uh, a group of people who you'll know about in a minute. And I get an email one day, and it said, Dear Lucy, I'm going to be at Stanford. Do you have an hour to let me pick your brain? And I said, N and it signed Bill. Oh. Bill. Uh, and I had no idea who this was. But I said, sure. <laughs> A couple of days later, his handler wrote, and it was Bill Gates. And then he asked me for some papers on boron chemistry. And I sent them. And he showed up at the allotted time, and we sat with lots of Coca-Cola, toe-to-toe. Uh, -to -toe. And he had read these papers and annotated them in little red ink. And we talked about orbital theory and how boron interacts with water as opposed to carbon. And then I realized that this new chemical space is important. And we have now built on that. <clears throat> and our small company, Anacor, just got FDA approval on our first drug. Second one is in phase three trials. And <clears throat> we have 120 employees and a market cap today of $1 billion. And so that was one part. The other part was talking to people, talking to people who could really affect change. So I spoke to, with Bill Clinton and his cabinet about emerging infectious diseases. I worked with people at, in the Bush administration about getting more money into this. And I speak wherever I can and wherever lay people will listen to me. I also teach at Stanford with um, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. We give a course called The Science of Weapons of Mass Destruction. And I talk about um, biowarfare and what that means. And then tell everybody 
that the clear and present danger is not bioterrorism, but emerging infectious diseases. That nature is the one we have to deal with, not terrorist states. Can you tell us your take on the Ebola crisis? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, it's really good for the press. Um, it, the, the amount of ink that's being spent on Ebola is probably not worth the effort. It is a terrible disease. It is difficult to catch. It is so virulent that it will burn itself out. It's a pity that we did not go ahead and make vaccines earlier when we could have in time, but we did not. But a much more serious problem is influenza. Between 40 and 50,000 Americans a year die of flu infection. And somehow this is, you know, it's not hot news. And there are now, you know, we take our shots and we say, well, it's going to protect us. Well, if you're over 60 and you take your shot, it's not probably going to protect you very much. But there are other strains of flu that are really lethal, 50% kill rates. They are not yet transmissible. But it's critical that we understand what will make those strains transmissible easily. And we have to build the uh, antivirals, the vaccines, and anything else in an armamentarium to make this thing a problem that can be solved. And I think that what, what Ebola has done is really raise our consciousness, like, oh my god, an infectious agent can get me and kill me. Uh, the flu, oh, well, we've heard about the flu for years. But that's the problem, guys, not Ebola. I think we'll open it up to questions from the audience now. Hello. Um, so there are many female scientists who have made their name in history, Marie Curie. But there are also some who perhaps haven't give, been given the recognition that they deserve. One example I can think of is Rosalind Franklin. So um, for actually for both you and um, Dame Shirley, who do you feel are some female scientists who you feel haven't gotten as much credit as they deserve, like either past or present? That's a hard question. Uh, it's a hard question because we, I don't know all these different fields. I know some. And to start pulling out the names of probably incredible women who have not gotten the recognition you're talking about would be very difficult and quite unfair to them. Uh, I think that it exists. It is a problem. But I think that what's happening here at Rockefeller is an attempt to address that. And I applaud the people and the women at Rockefeller who are doing that. I don't know if Dame Stephanie has anything to add to that. No. Well, I have another question about um, your, your, <laughs> your two um, uh, uh, antifungal drugs. Yes. What do they treat? Uh, well, the one that just got approved is uh, for onychomycosis of the toenail. And I would be willing to bet there are about 50% of the audience here <laughs> is suffering from toenail onychomycosis. Uh, I know it's not you, Richard. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and this is a topical that is this little tiny boron-containing compound that goes right through the nail bed. And it's really the only one out there that kills the bug. Uh, it's not cosmetic. It kills it. Uh, so that's one. Um, is that the one that was recently approved? That was recently approved. You can get it with a prescription. Uh, but the second topical is not an antifungal, and it was serendipity. All right? So we had an antibiotic that was effective against staph infections that kids get who have atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is pretty miserable for children. Uh, it's almost unbearable, and they get a secondary infection. And so we said, well, let's do a trial for staph infections with children. And the results were OK, but they weren't great. But then the physicians started calling in and saying, what the hell is this stuff? It's clearing the inflammation. 
He said, really? <laughs> and then I said, stop everything. Let's find out what the target is and what it's doing. And we found it to be a PDE4 inhibitor. And in a very large phase two trial showed that it was better than a steroid, topically, for clearing up these kids. And we're now in the middle of phase three with 700 children between the ages of two and 16. So you know, I use this as an example of you, we go in to do one thing, then we observe something else, and you just go for it and figure out how to make this work. And then behind that, we have another antibiotic. You talked about how you like to step back and look at a problem and think you know, about methodically how you would approach it. And so when I li I'm fascinated by your thoughts about the flu and the, you know, the, the threat that that poses to us. And so when you step back and you think about how you know, there's so many strains or where might the vectors be or you know, how, how do you approach that sort of overarching well, it's, way it's, to approach it? It's not very complicated. You find, <laughs> you find all the data that's available and understand why and how these strains can mutate to change, how they change their surface, antigens, how you have to change the various kinds of vaccines that you will build. And to me, it's not a complicated problem. It's a logical problem based on the data that one has. Now, every year when the government figures out which vaccine to make, they decide which is the most prevalent type a flu virus out there, but that's not enough. We have to look at what's coming up behind it and what is growing and will be a threat, if not this year, next year, and what is going to be a challenge for us in identifying what kind of flu virus is going to become transmissible with a sneeze. And how we can use animal models like ferrets that duplicate how a human is responding to a flu virus. So it's not magic, it's logic, and it's based on data. And everything we do is based on this kind of information that is being gathered constantly, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. You mentioned that between your uh, postdoctoral fellowship and your faculty transition, you took three months off to just think about what you wanted to do. And that so let, let me tell you how that really was. <laughs> <laughs> how, how that really was, was I was a postdoc. And six months into my postdoc, I was asked by the chair of the department that I got my PhD in to come back as an assistant professor and to take three months he gave it to me to think wow. about what I wanted to work on. They were not hiring the project I was working on. They were hiring me. And we still do that. It's rare, but of course it happens. I remember the first person I hired when I became chair of developmental biology was somebody named David Kingsley, who is an extraordinary uh, geneticist and who I knew was going to do amazing things in the study of evolution. But he hadn't published anything in this topic. But I knew his work. And I, I remember calling him up and saying, David, how would you like to come to Stanford? He said, no, I've already accepted Wisconsin. I'm sick of looking for jobs. And so the next day, I flew from California to Washington, to Frederick, Maryland, and walked into his lab. And I said, you're coming to Stanford. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and the rest is history. And the rest is history. He's, he's a remarkable scientist. This morning, you spoke passionately about that moment of discovery. But we never got an opportunity to ask you what your most memorable or exciting discovery in the lab was. There were a couple. But the one that turned out to be most important is, uh, remember I said I wanted to understand how the cell function to integrate all kinds of different events. So what I had done was set the lab up so that I had groups of people studying what I call different modules. Replication of the chromosome, segregation of the chromosome, building the divisome, 
you know, all kinds, you know, DNA methylation, all kinds of different things that had to happen at specific times in a cell cycle. And the big breakthrough came when one of my graduate students did an extremely clever genetic screen to try to find the transcription factor that controlled the genes in one of the modules. And then it turned out that this transcription factor controlled the top gene in the hierarchy for almost every one of these modules. And that was mind-boggling. And then everything flew from that. And it led to the discovery that there are five, just five transcription factors that run the genetic circuitry that integrates everything that the cell does, which genes are turned on when. <clears throat> and that was a pretty big moment. So you just told us a story about how persuasive you were um, in terms of recruiting Kingsley to Stanford. And I believe that you've also been very persuasive with some of your colleagues at Stanford, um, when you've been, especially when you've been in some situations where perhaps um, they weren't sort of, where the playing field wasn't equal for women and men. And I'm wondering whether uh, you could advise people about, uh, perhaps by example, uh, about the kinds of things that you've done um, to basically to sort of make people realize what they're doing and that it's unfair and that kind of thing. Well, I can tell you a story that I told the postdocs this morning. Uh, excuse me, gals, if you're hearing it again. But uh, this is not about recruiting. It's about admitting people to an MD-PhD program. And this was at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. It's a whole bunch of years ago. And it was one of the initial MD-PhD program going. And I was, of course, the only woman on the admissions committee. And the way we operated is we divided up all the interviews. We interviewed people, and then we wrote up our interviews. And then we all decided, based on these interviews, who we would admit. And I had noted that every time a woman applied, there was always a line that said, when I asked her how she was going to possibly combine motherhood with doing medicine and basic research, she either did or did not give a good answer. I, didn't, I said, how am I going to deal with this? You know, I can't say, don't do that. It's not going to work. So I waited until I got the ideal male candidate. David was wonderful. I, I remember him very clearly. <laughs> this must be 30 years ago. <clears throat> he was from Johns Hopkins. He had done everything right. He was a golden boy, research, medicine, he had done everything. And near the end of the interview, which was going very, very well, I said, now, David, how are you going to combine fatherhood? He had told me about his fiance and how he was very much looking forward to having children. I said, how are you going to combine research and medicine and raising your child? And he looked at me as though I were crazy. And he said, well, that's my wife's job. OK. So when I wrote up my write-up about David and I talked about all his wonderful attributes, I said, however, we cannot admit David because he's not thought about how he's going to be a father and a scientist and a physician. <laughs> of course, I didn't mean that in that way. He was accepted. He turned us down because he thought there was a crazy lady who interviewed him. <laughs> um, but never again, never again was that question asked of women who were applying to the MD-PhD program. So there are ways of doing this that can be quite effective, and that's just one example. Uh, for how much did you sell your paintings to the Ted Shedlovsky? <laughs> Selling artists, are you going to resume your paintings activity? Well, I've really, <laughs> I've really never stopped. <laughs> I still paint. I have no memory whatsoever <laughs> about how much that cost Ted. Uh, but I, he certainly adopted me. Uh, so it could have been quid pro quo. <laughs> Last question. Um, now that you have had so many years of uh, exp experimentation, if someone asked you to, 
to answer why Dante wrote the Divine Comedy <laughs> in the vernacular, would you be able to come to a different conclusion? And if so, what methodology oh, wow. would that have chosen? <laughs> Uh, the answer is that I no longer know enough to answer that intelligently. Uh, at the time, I did, and it was clearly a political situation between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, and we can talk about this offline. Uh, but it's been, what, 45 years <laughs> since I've thought about that. Um, I think, and I know what you're getting at, I think that the reason I enjoyed the chemistry so much. It was because for me it was realer than trying to interpret something that Guido Cavalcante said, you know, a zillion years ago in some cafe in Florence. Uh, understanding how molecules might behave just made a hell of a lot more sense to me than trying to reinterpret secondary and tertiary pieces of information. And I think that's what you're asking me. Yeah. We have a request for one last question here. Two sort of pragmatic questions. I didn't catch the name of the second disease that your uh, boron-based uh, uh, drugs attack. Or that was atopic dermatitis. I see. And uh, as it was previously uh, called eczema. Yes, it's eczema. eczema. And yes. as, in recognition of Brooklyn as a hotbed of cre creativity, which high school did you go to? I went to the High School of Music and Art. Ah. <laughs> I know there are many more questions, but unfortunately uh, we, we should really bring okay. this part of the evening to a close. I first would like to thank Lucy and congratulate her once again. Thank you. Everyone is standing. I'd also like to thank Dame Stephanie for her very yes. moving remarks on this yes. occasion.